Hello there, and welcome to Weird Music on the Glumberger channel. This is of course a show where each and every week we dive into an album, have a discussion, talk about it, and you know, chat about weird music, right? <laughs> or sometimes normal music, who knows. Uh, anyway, we're not doing that today, as you can tell, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, today, this is going to be my rundown of all of my favourite albums from the year of 2023, okay? So uh, a little bit before we, a little bit to discuss before we get into it. Um, there's a bit of a semblance of order to this list, list. Um, but as you'll no doubt see, it's entirely based on my incredibly weird, unusual opinions, rooted entirely in what has communicated, you know, something to me, whether it's something that resonates or something um, you know, emotional or something just interesting and unique. Um, Essentially, when trying to construct this list, I just I put in all the albums that you know over the year, you know, just just uh, communicated something to me, you know, and just had some kind of an impact. Hence, why it's full of these really weird, strange albums. I mean, I'll say here actually, there's a lot of ambient electronic and drone albums and experimental stuff here, which is just weird. But for some reason, it's just what I find really interesting, you know, as an individual. So, you know what? Enough waffling. Let's just get into it, shall we? Number 30. Dawn Recursion, The Lifted Index. And so to start off this list is, you know, a bun one of a bunch of albums that essentially extended the list outwards. You know, uh, when, we, when I first mentioned doing this, it was going to be around 20 albums, but no, we're doing 30 of them for some reason. <laughs> In any case, uh, release at the beginning of November. Dawn Recursion is uh, the latest album from The Lifted Index, released on Sale Records. And I'll say here that, that, as mentioned, there's a lot of ambient albums on this list, but maybe that's just because ambient music is something that really resonates with me a lot as an individual. In any case, this particular album really surprised me in a very pleasant way in how it just offers up these incredibly lovely textures across its 12 different tracks. And what I find interesting is a lot of these textures seem to come from the reversing of the instruments themselves, you know. Um, it just results in this experience that's you know, very unusual as a result, but it's also incredibly lovely and comforting that can easily put stressed out minds to a piece. <laughs> Number 29, Duo Improvisations, Kon Okuma and Leah Okagawa. So I think if any album is going to be demonstrative of just how opinionated this list is, this might be the one to do so. <laughs> but I just really like strange, unusual albums, and this one really fascinated me. <laughs> so released on Fault Records, of course. Uh, this record comprises uh, Kon Okuma performing the double bass or the cello. I'm not sure which one, sorry. Um, essentially droning away on it, plucking it, and just scraping the instrument in this really unusual way, whilst uh, Leo Okagawa backs it all up with this incredibly intense electronic humming that sounds like when you unplug your guitar from the amp, let the cable fall to the floor, and just ground the entire thing in an overwhelming buzz. <laughs> so, incredibly unusual, and I don't know why, but I really find this album fascinating, and it puts me into such a peculiar and unique headspace whenever I hear it. And for some reason, I've listened to this one a lot since it got released, and I don't really understand why, but it just fascinates me, hence why it's been included on this list for you. <laughs> Maybe we'll try to figure it out uh, uh, one day, um, you know, in a future episode. Who knows, who knows. Number 28, on a continuous form, Richard Chartier. So seasoned viewers of this show will no doubt know of my love and adoration of the lowercase genre. So when Richard Chartier announced his latest solo release under his own name for uh, his record label Line Imprint, uh, which was the first he's released on the label in three years, um, under his own name of course, um, I was essentially just really excited to hear what was coming. And so on a continuous forum, uh, which I believe is sort of a follow-up to continue, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, it's an incredibly subtle journey into sonic minimalism, of course, with Chartier drawing upon his archive of sounds and revisit revisiting them, and in his own words, reformatting, restructuring, 
refining and refinding. And the result is an album that feels so quintessentially like a chartier album, you know, feeling very reminiscent of his earlier works, you know, where you get these, you know, very subtle drones and, and hums whilst these electronics just ping like with these very weird frequencies in your ears. So many minute details that make it such a rewarding album to revisit uh, um, time and time again. Number 27, July 27, 2022, Kenneth Kirshner. So this is a really peculiar album, I have to say. Um, at nearly four hours in length, it's a rather demanding experimental album, I would say, but it's one that just resonates with such a beautiful, relaxing sense of calm and bewilderment, I would say. And so, as with um, most, if not all, of Ke uh, Kenneth Kirshner's works, named after the date it was begun, July 27, 2022. And it sees Kirshner exploring the resonance of the piano as an instrument, using rigorous editing to create this impossible composition. And I was drawn to this one as it was started and released on my birthday, which I found to be an extraordinary coincidence. Um, weirdly enough, I thought it was almost as though the universe was giving me a present, if that makes sense. Really weird. But embedded within this album are just these incredibly wonderful microtonal notes and um, that just expand outwards with this natural resonance, giving each and every one of the many, many notes on this album just this wonderful sense of place and time. And I'd say it's difficult to sit through the entire thing in one sitting, but it is easily one that just drifts on past like the clouds in the sky with such a calming sense of presence, just so beautiful to listen to. Number 26, Deathless, Hellish Form. And so this is an album I did do a deeper dive into earlier this year, if you'd like to know, and so if you'd like to know a little bit more information, by all means check it out. And so a short rundown though, Deathless is the uh, latest album from duo Willow, Ryan and Jacob Lee, offering up an intense funeral doom sludge album with some incredibly important themes within its very core. And on the band camp we were told the following regarding this album. Deathless is meant as a judgement of the purveyors of systemic transphobia and a balm to those suffering beneath its hold. And so somewhat similar to the band Agriculture, both in terms of ethos and the sound, um, they, uh, Death, uh, Hellas Forum have you know, taken metal stylings as well, and they've created something that's really brutal and harrowing to listen to, but also, weirdly enough, ecstatic and joyous as well. And it's a phenomenal album experience, I feel, like easily one of my favourites. Number 25, Monochrome's Volume 2, 2M. So, in a complete surprise to myself this year, Line Imprints announced the follow-up to what is easily one of the label's most beloved albums within the entire discography, Monochrome's Volume 2 by 2M. So, Volume 1, like with so many people, is without a doubt one of my favourite experimental ambient records from Line Imprint, as well as just one of my favourite ambient records of all time, I would say. It's a truly beautiful album that just drifts so effortlessly. And its follow-up is, you know, a wonderful successor that expands upon the world building established on that very first album. And so, once again, we're just guided through various tracks of these really dense airy drones that bring with them this incredibly melancholy emotion, it feels. And as a result, listening to Volume 2, it's like hearing from a friend you haven't heard from in an incredibly long time. And though the passing of time is you know, a sad thing. The sheer fact that you're reconnected after all this time, it brings with it such a sense of joy and wonder, if that makes sense. Number 24, the voice of Theseus, Jan Novak. And so I think within, you know, the past couple of years, you know, Jan Novak has really pushed out his creative endeavours and created some truly phenomenal album experiences as a result. 
And so the voice of Theseus released on Room 40 is the latest from Novak, a rather strange album of ambient album of sorts that inspired by the legend of Theseus and the thought experiment of the ship of Theseus, you know, where where you um, you have the ship of Theseus, you replace the mast, um, then you replace the bow and then you, uh, the, 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 the wood and everything. You just replace it all until the entire ship has essentially been replaced. And as a result, is it still the ship of Theseus or is it a new ship? Interesting thought experiment. And what Jan Novak has done is applied it to this very album experience through his uh, creative process, if that makes sense. And so by taking vocal performances from guests Dorian Wood and G Brenner, Novak manipulates them over the course of the album until they become completely different sounding experiences, yet but whilst also somehow still uh, tying into the original vocalist identities. It's very unusual and rather existential in its own weird way, but it's also truly beautiful and uh, interesting, rather joyous and celebratory in places. Wonderful stuff, I would say. Number 23, Ignore Grief, Shushu. And so ever since the wonderful audience of uh, Weird Music introduced me to Shushu, I've become a little bit obsessed with them, truth be told, and of course I had to listen to their latest album, Ignore Grief, right? And as someone who was taken in by the, you know, the incredibly dark, harrowing experience that was Girl with the Basket of Fruit, Ignore Grief seems to follow along in somewhat similar veins, you know, with explorations of incredibly dark aspects of human existence, you know, half inspired by real stories, the other half imaginary ones. And so at times, you know, much like what Shushu do, it's an incredibly overwhelming listening experience that bombards you with such an array of weird sounds and, and assortments of stuff happening, but it's one that revels in the darkness so brilliantly, and I think a really fine addition to Shushu's already incredible discography. Number 22. She came through the window to stand by the door. Natalia Bayliss and Eamar Rydy. So, um, with this album, I did do a bit of a deeper dive into this one earlier this year, so if you'd like to know more, by all means check it out. To go into it briefly though, um, this is an album that really fascinated me when I first came across it from a Twitter post by Stephen Matteo, who provided the mastering for it. Um, essentially what you've got are these lovely dense acoustic drones provided from one of the oldest organs in Ireland, um, uh, which just essentially you know, rumbles and reverberates throughout the very space of the church itself where it was performed and recorded. And what I love about albums like this is what I tend to describe as a sense of acoustic phenomena, where the dense layering of sounds provided from acoustic instruments fills up an entire room essentially and you just get so many effects happening as a result that are quite natural. It's an interesting one though, because this album's lovely in places and then also incredibly foreboding and intimidating in others, but it's one that just had this wonderful impact upon me when I first heard it. Number 21, Oxmordyke, Philip Jack and Chris Watson. And so this is an album I did, I do want to try to do a full video on at some point, like so many, but um... You know, we'll, we'll have to see though, these things do get lost in the ether sometimes. But um, there's, a, there's a very sad, tragic story behind this one, but it's also very fascinating. Uh, the short of it goes though, that um, whilst the late Philip Jack was in hospital in January 2022, he was uh, contacted by one Chris Watson, uh, who'd been making field recordings at the Oxmadike Rail Crossing. And whilst in hospital, armed with only his laptop, Jack reworked Watson's field recordings into the very album we have today. And this peculiar little sound odyssey, it's very reminiscent of the likes of Luke Ferrari, I feel, where the normality of sounds themselves, you know, um, in this case, uh, ones, that, ones of which place you right at the Oxmodag rail crossing, then become incredibly abstract, surreal experiences through Jack's tinkering. Very weird, but also incredibly rewarding as well, I would say. Number 20, Danger, Jogging House.
And so another ambient album, of course, like so many, but this is a really gorgeous and delightful one. And I, I just love this album. It's so lovely. <laughs> And so much, just like the warm colours of the album's cover suggests, this is a really gentle, relaxing journey through ambient soundscapes. And to be fair to Jogging House, um, Jogging House has released a bunch of stellar albums this year, but Danger was the one that communicated the most out of all of the various releases from 2023. I just really adore the sublime atmosphere present on this album as it guides itself so gently across its uh, runtime. So many wonderful moments on this one that make it a delight to re-listen to over and over again. Number 19, Agriculture, Agriculture. And so this was a very weird album that I was meaning to write, write about, uh, but just didn't get around to like so many albums, of course, I do apologize. We will see if we get to it at some point. Essentially, Incredibly loud overloading black metal combined with an unusual joyous ecstatic emotion that runs throughout the entire thing. Genuinely, a bit weird on paper, but agriculture make it work so incredibly well, resulting in this phenomenal album experience as a result. There's just something so wonderfully cathartic about this album, you know, something about it that just fills up your very body with this rising energy and just makes you feel unstoppable, like nothing can hold you back and there's nothing you can't achieve. I also have to mention though, the absurdly ridiculous font for the band, <laughs> completely illegible like so many black logos, right? but I think there's something brilliant about it, it really makes me laugh. Number 18, The Beggar, Swans. The Swans came out with a new album this year, of course, right? The Colossal Beggar, another double album, of course. <laughs> and so I'll be honest, um, although there was a lot I enjoyed from Leaving Meaning, the album itself didn't leave me with much optimism for the band's future releases. I kind of thought they were heading in an unusual direction, but whatever, whatever. Um, and then as well, when the singles for The Beggar came out, um, whilst I thought they were good, they didn't, like, amaze me in any way. However, uh, when the album did get released, though, and um, you could listen to the entire thing, that's when I thought everything started to make a lot more sense and everything clicked into place, as I feel like um, The Beggar works so much better as an entire album experience, if that makes sense. And to be fair, like I am fond of some of the individual songs. I think um, The Beggar Lover 3, the, you know, the 45 minute colossal sound collage is, you know, easily one of the most fascinating things Swans have released, you know, on one of their official studio albums. Like, like I think it's truly phenomenal. I should also say as well, um, seeing The Beggar uh, and the songs from The Beggar performed in the live con in the live context, which was also the first Swans gig for, my for myself as well, was also a truly astounding experience that also added a lot of context for the album. And, in some ways, might actually be a bit better than it, but that's a point of contention up to individuals, right? Maybe. In any case, though, the beggar, I think it's one of those albums that just grows a bit more on you each and every time you listen to it, and maybe we'll just have to see how it settles with time. But to be fair, it is very interesting and astounding in places. Number seventeen, travel, the next. So Travel is apparently the 19th studio album by jazz trio The Next, and it sees the band doing exactly what it is they do best, you know, creating long jazz-inspired improvisations that eschew traditional conventions of the genre in favour of moods. And what I love is the constant bouncing of the bass, you know, to the consistent pushing of the drums, you know, offset by the most brilliant sounding pianos that just you know, hold enough delay effect to extend the notes out to satisfying lengths while he just noodles around this you know, wonderful assortment of notes. And for me, anytime you get that heavy descent on the piano, it just ends up being so satisfying um, to hear, I feel. I, I should say as well, it's the album's opener signal that is a particular highlight to me. You know? Driven along by that bass and drum pattern, you know, the, the piano just ends up circling these various notes as the percussion continues to drive it all along. 
And in my head, I can't help but just imagine the passing of streetlights on a busy highway, flashing consistently with each and every beat on this thing. Number 16, sensitive, mind over MIDI. Right, so um, to quickly mention, um, 2023, um, kind of an awful year in many ways, um, you know, in terms of the ambient music scene, as we lost so many uh, musicians. And this is an album um, I feel a little bit weird about, to be fair, like, uh, I'll try my best to explain it, but um, essentially, um, whilst I was familiar with Mind Over Midi and, you know, his vast work prior to his passing, he was one of those artists that I'd never taken the time to properly listen to, if that made sense. And I always find it a little bit weird discovering a musician's work after their passing, if that makes sense, because death itself adds a really weird context to things and it makes it very unusual, I find. A little bit hard to explain. Regardless of feeling that way though, I did decide to listen to Sensitive by Mind Over Midi when it was announced and I have to say, like, this album is truly beautiful and one of the most loveliest things I've heard throughout the entire year, you know? It's essentially one of the last albums that uh, Hells was working on before his, you know, sad, uh, sad passing. And it's essentially a beautiful journey inspired by the simple notion of sensitivity and this wonderful, patient, emotional album experience that delights in this profound existentialism where, you know, we, we're all sensitive individuals on some level and it's not something we should be, you know, you know, um, anxious about it, that makes sense, but rather it's kind of a thing that makes you unique in a, in a beautiful way and essentially Though this album is a lovely journey through that very notion and I really adore it as a result. It's so beautiful to listen to. Number 15. Apparitions of Volume 1, Olivia Alari. So Olivia Alari is somewhat of a familiar name among fans of Lion Imprint, I feel, and Apparitions Volume 1, um, his latest album uh, for the label released back in April. And so having ex previously explored the world of sign oscillators for his previous album for Lion, Apparition saw the composer exploring the world of acoustic instrumentation and acoustic phenomena, examining the relationship of instruments and the very sounds they produce and the peculiar effects that they can end up producing when you really just layer these things in a very weird way. It's an incredibly experimental release, with each track exploring a different instrument. You've got the first track exploring violas, second track exploring vibraphones in the marimba, and the last track looking at bassoons. And with them all playing in such unusual ways, they all just sound like these odd spectres of the instruments themselves, you know? And it's a challenging listen, but it's one that really delights in the spectral qualities of the acoustic phenomena produced from these very instruments. Number 14, Expanding Majesty, Mamatus. So within the whole incredibly loud, crunchy, heavy, psychedelic rock scene, whatever you'd want to call it, Mamatus has always been one of my favorites, you know? <laughs> They're one of those bands that just put a smile on my face every time I hear them. <laughs> so you can bet I was excited to get my ears around their latest album, Expanding Majesty, their first full length album in roughly eight years. And at roughly 69, nice, minutes in length, uh, this is an incredibly long, chunky album. But it's one that sees Mamatas doing exactly what it is they do best, offering up incredibly loud slabs of exquisite psych rock. And Expanding Majesty just has about everything you would want in a record of this genre. You know, it bombards, it slays, and it kills with monolithic riffs and it absurdly precise guitar playing and just wonderful momentum that just goes and goes and goes. <laughs> What's interesting about this one is the kind of new directions and new concept the band explore, you know, showcasing that there's so much more to them than just simply being this intense psych rock band. A perfectly indulgent record that, you know, demands to just be louder and louder, I'd say. <laughs> Number 13. Passages. 
Ayami Suzuki. And so another one of Lotano series releases for 2023. Um, Ayami Suzuki, to be fair, uh, was an artist I discovered through her collaboration with Leo Okagawa on Fault Records when I'd been slowly working my way through the label's very large discography. And this latest album from Suzuki, um, this is an incredibly emotive album experience, I feel, that combines these very dense Basensky-like drones with this really beautiful vocal layering to create this rather dark ambient experience that guides itself through a rather spectral journey. And I have to say, I really enjoyed the album's third track, Silhouette, where both of these layers combine so effortlessly together in the result of this incredibly melancholy and emotional experience. Like, all you can do is just hang your head low and just be guided through the passages by Suzuki. Number 12, The Leams Boist. Terror. So of course this is another album we did do a very lengthy discussion of earlier this year um, and I have to say like diving into this one turned into a right rabbit hole, really fascinating stuff. And so uh, The Leams Boist, one of two albums that Patero actually released this year, um, but easily one of my favourite albums within the experimental, ambient, electronic genre or whatever you want to call it really. And so to briefly mention it, uh, inspired by the incredibly strange Doddleston messages, um, there's just this incredibly strange, profound sense of mystery and intrigue within these very compositions that are kind of grumpy and moody, to be fair. But it all results in this wonderful expressive story that doesn't use words to guide you through this really strange journey into this very unusual story of something that may or may not have happened. <laughs> Number 11. Circulation of Subtleties, Jonathan Deasy and Matt Atkins. And so I have to say, uh, Matt Atkins has certainly been incredibly busy this year, releasing a whole bunch of different albums over the many, many months. My favourite of his many works though, uh, and probably my favourite release from Fault Records of this year, um, is the wonderful collaboration with Jonathan Deasy, Circulation of Subtleties. And so this two-track album, released on cassette of course, um, it's a strangely esoteric yet delightful murmuring of hushed electronics um, and tape recorders on the A side, which then transforms into this wonderfully strange warbling of gentle drones and electronics on the B side. It's such a strange album experience that just feels so unusual, but there's something weirdly delightful about this one that makes it really wonderful to listen to, I think. <laughs> Number 10. Shell of a City, Lisa Lurkenfeld. And so, uh, it might be a bit odd of me to include a 40-minute minimalist murmuring drone album on this list, but for some reason, Lisa Lurkenfeld's Shell of a City just really ticked a lot of boxes for the kinds of things I enjoy in minimalist albums. And so sourced from durational contact recordings of a highway substructure, Shell of a City is this incredibly long droning composition that really places you in this unusual, uh, you know, place essentially. <laughs> essentially just drawing you into the minute details of these incredibly large imposing concrete structures. And listening to this album, it gives you this very odd sense of liminal space, you know, the recollection of some distant memory of gazing out towards you know, the large imposing architecture that looms so high above one as the wind echoes throughout its many streets. It's an oddly immersive album experience and it's one that can really hypnotise you the more you drift off within this one. Number 9. Future Shadow 1, The Clandestine Gate, Bellwitch. So, it's um, been six years or so since uh, Funeral Doom act Bellwitch released the incredible gargantuan album Mirror Reaper, easily one of the most phenomenal and powerful Doom albums ever conceived in my opinion. And it was this year though that saw the release of their latest album, Future Shadow Part 1, The Clandestine Gate, which is another gargantuan recording spanning roughly 80 minutes in length. And this, you know, composition, it brings us 
right back to that Bellwitch style of incredibly slow tempos, beautifully haunting ethereal vocals and this incredible low-end doom that feels like this existential experience of being guided deeper and deeper into the afterlife itself. It's truly a phenomenal album experience that just continues to push and at times pulverise across that incredibly lengthy runtime, overloading you in this existential experience. And from my understanding as well, this album is only the beginning, with you know, Bellwitch planning uh, Future Shadow to be a triptych of you know, incredibly long form album experiences. And so what is beyond the clandestine gate? We can only wait and find out. Number 8. Harp Swells, Will Sampson. So, um, every now and then, uh, the wonderful record label 12K releases something on cassette. And for some reason, the albums that uh, they do so are always these incredibly lovely intimate album experiences. Is it a coincidence? Most likely. This year, though, saw the release of Harp's Wells by Will Sampson, which is this truly beautiful six-track album experience that just, you know, flows from track to track so peacefully, offering this lovely, relaxing ambient experience that just gently calms your soul. And there's a wonderful progression to this album, utilising a number of voices in a few of the tracks that make the whole thing sound rather introspective and devotional at times. And I think with how this year has gone, you know, um, Finding comfort in ambient music is something that my soul just strives for, if that makes any sense. And Half Swells is one that provided um, just the exact level of comfort and understanding that I needed in an ambient record at what I would say is just the right kind of time. And as such, I'm really grateful for it. Number seven, Salvage Enterprise, The Polyphonic Spree. So I have to say, there's nothing quite like it when a band you love and respect end up releasing an album after, you know, many years of inactivity. Which for the Polyphonics 3, there were many reasons for it to be fair, you know. Um, but of course, when they finally do release that album, it ends up being a truly joyful, wholesome and all-round wonderful album experience. <laughs> And I have to say, the latest album from the collective Polyphonic Spree sees band leader Tim DeLotta you know, really delving deep into his own insecurities, presenting a rather vulnerable side to himself that comes out in the most loveliest, wholesome sounding music. And from start to end, you get the most pristine instrumentals, as you always do with the band, you know, uh, which at times kind of sound a bit, uh, bit Pink Floydian at times, in a very cool, interesting way. All the while, Tim just beautifully singing such lovely laments of just wanting everything in life that nourishes your soul. I just truly adore how warm and intimate this album is from start to finish, and I think easily one of the best albums they've done in their whole discography, I would say. Number 6. A Field Guide to Phantasmic Birds, Kate Carr. So, this is one of those albums that I also had to go back in and add suddenly, um, as it released towards the tail end of the year. <laughs> but yep, the latest album from Kate Carr, A Field Guide to Phantasmic Birds, released on none other than Room 40 of course, um, this album is genuinely the kind of thing I just adore in experimental ambient music. You're getting a lovely combination of field recordings, which in this case, source from recordings of Dawn Chorus in Africa, Australia, and the UK between the years of 2015 to 2022. Alongside that, you also get many ambient layers though to help bring life and depth to the recordings themselves, you know? And what you end up getting is this wonderful experience that flips between reality itself and the abstract, you know, with the field recordings shifting and morphing into these entirely new creatures themselves who uh, cause careful manipulation of them. You just end up in this lovely, otherworldly landscape full of the most mystic and exotic birds existing alongside the loveliest of ambient layers. Number 5. You are clearly in perversion. Dorian Wood and Thor Harris. 
So, one of my favourite collaborative albums of this year, the incredibly impactful You Are Clearly in Perversion by Dorian Wood and Thor Harris. So funnily enough, this is the second time Dorian Woods um, appeared on this 2023 list as he collaborated on The Voice of Theseus by Jan Novak. Um, sadly, Thor Harris wasn't with Swans for The Beggar though, so this is his only inclusion on this list. Any anyway though, um, this three track album though, released on cassette, um, is a fantastic myriad of these incredible instrumental passages sourced from such a wide variety of instruments, you know. Um, ranging from synths to drums, congas, marimbas, violins, saws, trombones, vibraphones, clarinets, etc, etc, etc. Whilst Dorian Wood so brilliantly sings with this impeccable and amazing sounding voice, you know, offering these incredibly introspective and rather melancholy musings on identity, life, sex and physical beings, etc, etc. And what's amazing is there's a wonderful array of guest musicians on this one, including the likes of Carla Bozilet, David Coulter and even Jarvo, as well as many, many more as well. It's, an, it's a wonderful experimental album that just constantly shifts and changes as you guide yourself through the whole thing, and easily one of my favourite experimental releases of this year. <laughs> Number 4. King Lee. A Wave A Mouth. Uh, so King Lee uh, was the latest album from A Wave A Mouth, uh, one of a bunch of albums released on Jan Novak's record label Dragon's Eye Recordings. And I'll say here, there is a video that has um, already been created and edited that is um, scheduled for release um, that I've done about this entire album that will go into a lot more detail about this one that I'm actually really excited to get out, to be fair. <laughs> um, to go into it briefly though, this album um, is a beautiful introspective album experience that sort of straddles the line between an awareness of the everyday world around us and binary expectations. And as mentioned, contrasting it with a new reality, one born of love that is separate from such expectations. And so since this release, I have just been obsessed with this album though since I first heard it as it's genuinely such a lovely, intimate and beautiful album experience that is so comforting when it closes off by um, in its final moments. It's one of the most beautiful things I've heard this year and yeah, I'm very, I'm very excited for you all to see the video on this one. <laughs> Number 3. In Chemical Transit. All Men Unto Me. So this is an album that really blew me away when I first heard it. All, so All Men Unto Me is the solo project of one Ryan Glee, lead vocalist for the live performances of Ashen Spire. Uh, so In Chemical Transit is a truly fascinating album that sees Glee exploring um, his own vocal journey from pre-transition to 8 weeks on testosterone to 2.5 years on testosterone. And so utilise the recordings from across this long period, you're getting this peculiar time capsule of vocal performances ranging from operatic to incredibly hefty screams, all documenting the changing of his own voice. And what I, what I love is the incredible vulnerableness to the album itself, punctuated by this interlude centred right in the middle of this album that demonstrates the very effect that testosterone was having upon his voice, you know, the reduction in octave, octaves as it you know, has its effect essentially, and it's a really fascinating track to include on this album that's so poignant as a result I feel. It's an amazing album that demonstrates the many facets of Gleave's voice as well, from the, you know, the incredible range of vocal styles as well as you know the vulnerable breaks in his own voice that form a part of this very experience. It's really interesting. <laughs> Number two, No Highs, Tim Hecker. And so another album that we also discussed earlier this year on the Weird Music series, so if you would like to see the deeper dive, by all means go check it out if you'd like. <laughs> And so to briefly go into it though, uh, No Highs, easily one of my favourite albums of this year as I've mentioned a lot, you know, um, with Hecker essentially producing this really dark gloomy atmosphere that delves deep into themes of depression and anxiety and monotony. <laughs> um, 
So across this whole album, you just get this incredible album experience that, you know, it never raises your mood in any way or form. But instead, it just continues to navigate through misery and self-loathing through... And as a result, it's such a grumpy, moody album experience. But I just adore how perfectly Tim Hecker was able to communicate the ideas and themes of this album through what... What I guess you could call is abstract instrumental music, right? And yeah, for a long while, this was genuinely my favourite album of the year until it got overthrown by the album that is indeed in the number one spot. Number one, Saved, Reverend Kristen Michael Hayter. So before we just, uh, start this one, I'll just say, I think whatever anybody picks for their number one spot is always going to get them flat from some people, but we are all different. We all have different opinions and different things resonate with us in different ways. And so for me personally, when I first heard Saved, I was just blown away by this entire album experience. This whole album is just so weirdly phenomenal, I find, from the incredible creaky wheezing instrumentals that sound like some pump organ found within the basement of an abandoned church, to the whole concept of Hater documenting her own salvation through, um, through religion itself. You essentially get this incredibly powerful album experience that sounds so skewed and peculiar, and yet it's so engrossing and it just keeps you coming back for more and more. And so, this album sees Hater, you know, presenting a combination of new original songs and a couple of gospel classics as well, um, as well as including, you know, a wonderful version of The Poor Wayfaring Stranger and even a Blind Willie Johnson cover as well. And it all comes together into this incredibly weird package where it feels like you've stumbled upon an old religious vinyl record from the 1920s, it feels, featuring beautiful devotional singing and terrifying speaking in tongues. It's weird because it, the whole experience, it feels so incredibly cohesive and yet it takes so many different twists and turns across its runtime. And so to briefly mention it here, um, after hearing that Hater was retiring the uh, lingua ignota moniker, citing the unhealthiness of reliving trauma so viscerally through her music, um, I thought it was genuinely delightful to see her still continuing to create such wonderful and unique music. And um, the progression, um, you know, going, uh, you know, you know, going from the lingua ignota style to this style is amazing because this album really delves into just very experimental notions and ideas. And as well, I have to say, the progression from this album, you know, from start to end, you know, starting with these, you know, devotional uh, songs that are just warped by these very unusual effects to, uh, you know through these devotional songs of, you know, discussing fear and faith, and then finishing on the final track of How Can I Keep From Singing, where Hater beautifully sings the traditional song, offsetting it with this frantic babbling, screaming and crying. It's genuinely one of the most astounding things I've ever heard. Like, when I first heard this, I was kind of just sat there stunned when I was hearing this thing for the first time. It really just left me in this peculiar existential state and without a doubt, easily my favourite album this year. I think there is nothing else like it, truth be told. <laughs> and so with that, yeah, we've essentially gone over my entire list for the year, haven't we? Um, I really don't know what anyone's going to make of this list. I think you're probably going to have strong opinions one way or the other, but I think that's fine, right? Because, like said, different things communicate to different people, you know? These are the albums that in some way or form just spoke to me across the year, you know, were resonating something with me, whether it's, you know, a peculiarity or something beautiful or emotional or just weird, you know? <laughs> and to be fair, it's the fact that it communicates something to you is what fascinates me as a music enthusiast. And I'm hoping that maybe you found this interesting on some level. Maybe interesting enough to go check out this variety of different music. Who knows? And so, yeah, I think with that, we'll uh, we'll come to the end of our top 30 albums of 2023. Why not? <laughs> just a silly little video I wanted to make to try and consolidate some of my opinions I've had over this year, as well as just express my enthusiasm for music in general, you know? <laughs> and so if you've watched this far, then please, by all means, 
let me know in the comments what some of your favorite albums have been throughout this year, regardless of what they are, who they're by, what genre, etc, etc, because I would love to know what kind of music communicated itself to you over this year. And then, maybe I'll go check them out. <laughs> we will see, we will see. For now though, I would like to thank you for watching Weird Music, of course, and as well, thank you for all the support this very strange little show has been getting, you know. Um, in the new year, we're hoping to do more and more videos, of course. Uh, there's a whole bunch that are scheduled for release. Um, more reviews of strange albums, like, we'll see what happens, right? I can't wait for it. <laughs> and so, yeah, I wish you all the best. Take care and bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Christ is